Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. On today's show, we have our friend and colleague, Sandra Elia, who is a certified food addiction counselor and a pioneer in the field of addictive eating. Her expertise has brought about partnerships with Canada's top obesity and addiction doctors. Clients report improved health, improved sense of well-being. Most importantly, they are able to change their relationship with food. Sandra runs an outpatient food addiction recovery program in medical weight management clinics across Canada. Sandra is dedicated to changing the conversation so that anyone living with food addiction has access to treatment that is steeped with dignity, respect, and understanding. On this episode, Sandra shares her personal story of food addiction recovery. She talks about her work with Obesity Matters and why addressing health starts with finding a sense of self-worth and why shame, guilt, and blame won't work for the food addict looking at getting into recovery or anyone else for that matter. What we loved about this conversation was how she reiterated that being too close-minded and rigid in our beliefs in the food addiction world can be detrimental to our message being heard. She speaks about why it's so important as professionals to separate our own personal bias and be willing to listen about all the ways that have worked for other people in the food addiction space. Today, we speak about some controversial ideas and how for some individuals, anti-obesity medicines can actually be a great harm reduction approach because of how obesity affects the brain and makes the reward center more susceptible and sensitive to food cues. We appreciated hearing how Sandra works with individuals in bigger bodies to move towards body acceptance and what her thoughts are on the scale. We also discuss the importance of shifting your perception around what is food and what is actually drugs. We want to highlight that Sandra is hosting a rare online program, Get Abstinent, Stay Abstinent, that starts September 27th. It's a 28-day inpatient or outpatient but online treatment program for food addiction recovery. This program will be providing you with daily support, expert guest speakers, weekend sessions to learn meal planning, and one-on-one sessions with Sandra. If you're interested in learning more, we'll link it in the show notes. We really enjoyed this conversation, and we know you will too. Thank you so much for being here, Sandra. Sandra, Sandra. 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 All right. Can you share your personal story with us and your aha moment when it came to discovering you were maybe a food addict? Oh, for sure. First of all, thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure to be on. I've been following this group and it's that very near and dear to my heart because I'm a food addict. (laughs) So I think that my addiction really, really took off in my early 20s. I had always had weight problems and weight issues. And I discovered as a young child that food could be really comforting. But I think it was in my 20s when it really took off. And it was such an interesting time because I had left my home in my home of origin that had a lot of trauma and a lot of pain and chaos and violence. And I was on my own and I was free and I was newly married. And so you would think that it would be such a time of joyous and contentment, but it wasn't. (laughs) It was actually a time of like, oh my gosh, what did I just go through? And do I pretend it never happened or do I deal with it? And in my early 20s, I decided to go with pretend it never happened. which doesn't work because it just came up for me as eating. And my eating through the years became more and more uncontrollable. And I was very much a yo-yo dieter. And I remember the very last diet I ever went on, I had lost 50 pounds in six months, which is pretty dramatic and pretty quickly. And what I had done, which I know now, is started the starvation mode in my brain. And that's a real thing when you eat too little because human history, famine was was a real threat. And so my brain had no idea that I was on this diet to look good. It thought, oh my gosh, Sandra's in a famine. And when we kick in the starvation mode by having doing a really 
restrictive diet, a cascade of events happen in our brain that's completely outside of our control that drives us to seek food and eat food and not just any food. Like our brain is efficient, calorie dense, sugary foods. And so from losing 50 pounds, I gained the 50 back and an additional 50. So I gained about a hundred pounds in a little over a year, which was one of the most humiliating experiences I've ever gone through because I was working at a great consulting firm on Bay Street in Toronto and people were witnessing me getting bigger and bigger each month. And the hardest for me was when somebody hadn't seen me for a few months and I could see that they were taken aback and gasped at how much weight I was gaining. And I wish I could tell you, you know, it was just the eating and my weight that was out of control. But as food addicts, we know that it affects every area of our eyes. My whole life was spiraling out of control. I was in this bad marriage and I didn't want to deal with it because, hey, he let me binge eat. He let me eat as much as I wanted. And that was my consolation prize. Like this is a bad marriage. I'm not getting my needs met, but I can eat and he doesn't bug me about that. I was in a tremendously codependent relationship with my mother and I was trying to save her. And as a result, she was taking me down with her And I was on extended leave from work. So that was where it all came to a head. 100 pounds overweight, sick, tired, depressed, can't get a handle on my life, ready to check out. You know, I'm 48 when I think that I was ready to check out at 29. Oh my God. Like (laughs) the last 20 years have been wonderful and filled with blessings and miracles that I never thought were possible. But at that point in my life, I just thought I can't, like food was my drug my almighty drug, and it robbed me of everything. So my aha moment, my big aha moment was when I found Overeaters Anonymous. So that's a 12-step program. And I let go of the idea of ever losing weight again. And I just needed to eat to be sane because I couldn't keep eating that way and I couldn't keep living that way and I couldn't lose weight. So I thought, you know what? Let me let go of that. I honestly didn't care if I would ever lose another pound again because that scale never made me happy. It really didn't matter what the number was. And that's why today my weight is none of my business. My business is just to eat whole foods, move my body, wherever my weight ends up, ends up, and then my job is to love and accept this body. But that was the first step. And from that first step of not looking at, examining, focusing on the weight, I was able to lose over 100 pounds. So it's that paradoxical idea. So then how did you get into kind of the field of food addiction and working with food addicts? So I, as I mentioned, I worked for a consulting firm on Bay Street and I spent a bulk of my career, my adult career there. I was for there for 15 years and it was uh, honestly one of those great blessings in my life and rewarding work and travel. It was rewarding financially, but it was not rewarding spiritually at all. <laughs> like not even an iota. And uh, 10 years ago, I gave birth to my beautiful daughter. And during that leave, it became apparent to me that I was going to be a single mother. And it would have been very difficult to go back to that Bay Street job with the hours and the travel that was sometimes required and be a single mom. So I decided that I was going to... It wasn't even me that decided. It was really the universe that put a series of events in the right order and gave me everything that I needed to be able to leave that job. It's funny how that works. And somebody who knows me like a soul sister... Because what I was originally going to do was become a professional coach, which I I still am. She said, oh, are you going to help food addicts? I was like, no, 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 no. I can't help food addicts. Are you crazy? No, no, no. There's only one way to recover. That's through the 12 steps. You got to get the big book. You got to do the steps. You don't charge for that work. I can't help food addicts. And plus, like, who's going to follow me? I'm not on the cover of Health Magazine. I don't have a six pack. Like people who want to control their weight or eating, they want somebody who's a bikini model. They don't want to look at me. Then, (laughs) again, just a series of events, I kind of just put my toe in the pool, like literally, I just like just to feel it. And all these opportunities and all these people and all these doors open for me in ways that I could never imagine. I'm really, really fortunate. That's so wonderful. And I know now you're working with Obesity Matters. What have been some of the successes you've experienced there? Can you tell us a little bit more about the organization and what are some of the challenges being on the advisory board? 
Yeah, for sure. So very proud of Obesity Matters. It's a new nonprofit organization. And our aim is to really help people who are living with and struggling with obesity to create a community where people can come and get evidence based information because we know that there's a lot of bad information out there. And there's a billion dollar industry that really preys on the desperate, right? That was me. In my 20s, I think I did a calculation and got to remember this was a long time ago. I spent something like $20,000 on commercial diets. And it didn't matter. Like I would sit across from somebody to say, you're going to do this ridiculous diet. And then we're going to put these electrodes to your gut and you're going to get a six pack and it's $4,000. I'm like, okay, here you go. Because I was desperate. Like it didn't matter. As long as they told me I was going to lose in a substantial amount of weight in a little bit of time, I would give them any kind of money. So we're really trying to fight that culture. And we're also trying to embrace that success is different for everyone and success looks different for everybody. So not everybody is going to be a runway model and that's okay. Runway models have won the genetic lottery. That's what they've done. (laughs) Like that's it. I have green eyes. I didn't earn them. I'm really appreciative of them. I love my eyes, but they were just given to me. And for a lot of models, they have won the genetic lottery and I'm always happy for people to win the lottery. However, the problem is that I have a 10-year-old daughter and my 10-year-old daughter is going to look at the runway models and say, hmm, I didn't win the lottery. I don't look like that. And I think that's the only form of beauty. And even worse is the Photoshopping and the airbrushing and thinking that's real. At least we know that's not real. We're old enough and we still get kind of fooled by it. But imagine young people. So we're a community, we're educating, we're bringing people together. I'm the patient advocate and the director of education. We're very agile. So we listen to our community, we respond to what they want. And we're also going into schools because we know that prevention is way better (laughs) than treatment. So we're trying to really establish a program where children are kind to themselves, kind to their children, sorry, to their friends and kind to their communities and understanding that health really starts with a sense of self-worth. My favorite quote from William Goldberg is, I've never seen a person change constructively when motivated by shame, guilt, or hate. And think about how many people embark on a weight loss journey or even a 12-step program filled with shame, guilt, and hate. And it's tough. It's tough going. But the truth is we all deserve in this one moment exactly as you are self-acceptance and self-love because love is energizing. And how much energy do you need, really? <laughs> like, I, right? To maintain a lifestyle of health and happiness requires a lot of energy and hate will always drain you. So what are some of the challenges that you face working with, with this organization? Yeah, for sure. So I think some of the challenges that we face include people who are not sure if we are body acceptance or treatment. And we get bumped up against that all the time because we are definitely about body acceptance. So then we get the backlash. Then you shouldn't be talking about treatment. And my take on that is humans have a natural desire to flourish, to evolve, and to get better. So let's look at it in a different area. Let's say it's my career, right? I want to get better every single year. But that doesn't mean I don't accept myself today. I'm a professional speaker. I love the work I do today, but in five years, I want to be better. So that doesn't mean I'm filled with self-hate today. And that's where it gets a little bit dicey because people in the body acceptance movement believe that that means you love yourself and you don't want to change. And we believe both can be possible. Yeah. I think we find that with food addiction clients all the time too, right? That there's this, we want that acceptance piece and we want it to not be about the weight and the scale and that kind of thing for our clients, right? Because that can become just another like mental obsession, but also we want to honor and support if somebody is in a larger body and they're struggling with health conditions or inflammation in their knees or hips, that intentional weight loss is something that at some point they may want to address on their journey. And that doesn't mean that, that those two things can't go together, right? Like those things can't, it's not that they can't go together. It's just We have to like do it in the right order, have the right support and make sure that we have a mindset and a framework around it. That's And I think you bring up such an important point, the right order. Because most of my clients say, 
oh no, I would love and accept myself when I lose 50 pounds. I'm like, wrong order. It doesn't work that way. You can't get there from there. You can't get there. Like, I'm going to love myself when, right? It's just like being with a partner who says, oh, I'll marry you when you have a million dollars in the bank and you lose 50 pounds. You're like, adios. Yes, exactly. So we know that you work with clinicians and you've been like in office spaces. And I think you've even done like telemedicine kind of things like way over on the other side of Canada from where you are. So what advice would you have for us? Somebody like Clarissa and I, well, Clarissa is in your area, so it might be a little different, but I'm in the U S. So what advice might you have for us to get connected with the medical professionals in our communities? What have you found that opens the door? So they'll actually hear what you have to say. Not easy. (laughs) I'm going to start by saying that not easy, but absolutely possible. So the smartest thing I did when I decided to go into this field was I joined the board of Obesity Canada. So different from Obesity Matters, that's more patient focused. So Obesity Canada is a network of professionals dealing with the treatment of obesity. Now, as a food addiction counselor and in the food addiction world, we can sometimes be closed minded, which means then we don't get a place at the table. So your first step has to be opening your mind. If I went to healthcare professionals and said, listen, there's only one way to recover from food addicts. Here's the one meal plan that they have to follow. And this is the only route. They would say, thank you, Sandra, you're biased. And we can't have you at this table because that's what it is. It's biased to believe there is only one way to recover and it is not serving our clients. So that was the first step. I had to associate with people, doctors, scientists, psychologists, people from many different facets, all looking at compulsive overeating, binge eating, obesity, what looked like food addiction. And when I started, they didn't really believe in it, but that's changing. That's absolutely changing. And understand how they treat it. And understand that there are so many contributing factors to obesity as there are many contributing factors to food addiction, which means people should have many interventions. There is no one single intervention. And in fact, for the listeners, if somebody tells you they have the one way and it is the way, I suggest you run the other way (laughs) because there is no one way. Nobody has the secret. The person who cracks this code, because we know that obesity is a big problem, whoever cracks this code is going to be a multi-billionaire. But until then, your best route is to have many different interventions, making sure you're getting enough sleep, making sure you're getting counseling for the things that drive you to eat for comfort, a sustainable meal plan. Like not a diet, but a meal plan. And if you think about it, I have the great joy of being a great aunt. So my niece, nieces have nephews, uh, had children, they're my great nephews. And I watch my nieces put a meal plan together so that their children will thrive. Guess what? It doesn't end when they're four. We need a meal plan at every stage of our life that changes and evolves with our activity level, our health needs. We also have to consider cultural preferences. You know, nobody should be saying to somebody, you can't eat that if that's what their ancestors have ate for generations. We can help them make it healthier for sure. But we shouldn't be saying, no, sorry, lentils can't be on your plan because they're too carby. (laughs) It's like, wait a minute, this person was born in India. I think they should have lentils. Anyway, don't get me off on a tangent. So I sat on that board with many doctors and I you know, would put my hand up to volunteer. I would put my hand up to speak. That was the big one. So just having the courage to be able to stand up and talk about what I knew about food addiction and also be open to having them correct me, right? They were the ones who taught me that some of my opinions <laughs> of food addiction were biased, that I had to be open to research and I had to be open to what else could possibly work. And so we did a pilot. I was very fortunate to do a pilot at the Wharton Medical Clinic. And it had to be medically supervised at first. It was covered by OHIP, which was wonderful. And I did two runs until Dr. Wharton himself sat in on one of them. And and then he gave me his blessing. He's like, okay, you don't need medical supervision anymore. This is your program. Now that program runs in clinics across Canada, also in BC. So we'll start another round in September. 150 patients come in over Zoom on from BC and off we go. I created my own eight-week program. So this is my program. This is for primarily people who 12-step programs don't work. And so I, for a big part of my life, was a big book thumper. Like I just thought, 
if you're not willing to do the steps, then you need to go out and suffer some more and hit rock bottom and come back. And one of my mentors at ChemH taught me that that's actually very cruel, that a person in the throes of addiction is suffering. And 12-step programs only work, I think, for about 20% of the population. So that 80% that it's never going to work for, you're just telling them to go suffer? Like, that's cruel. And I don't think he used those words, but that's the way I interpret it. And I remember leaving his office going, I'm going to create my own program. And it's going to be for people that this the 12-step programs don't work for. Now, I'm not disparaging 12 steps because they saved my life and they continue to save millions of lives. But understand that it doesn't work for everybody. And now, recently, I've partnered with Dr. Sandy Van to create three sales. So Dr. Sandy Van is one of the top doctors in Canada using cognitive behavioral therapy for compulsive overeating, emotional eating. And that program, I help people who are not food addicts. They could be, but they don't need to be. So I've really expanded to include a whole spectrum of eaters. And in fact, everybody's on a spectrum of eating, right? I know I'm a late stage food addict. I'm a very destructive eater in my disease. So, but not everybody's at that point. There's a whole spectrum. And also in my career, I've done a lot of public speaking. That is another way. So I also do a lot of public speaking early when I was trying to get my program off the ground. I did community radio. So I used to do, it was a lot of work for no money, uh, but I began to build a tribe. It was at York University here in Toronto. And I would go in, I would do a one hour radio show. I tell a little bit about my story, give practical steps and interview experts. And I'm always looking, I have an entrepreneurial brain. I'm always looking at how I can impact, how I can be of value. And I cross all lines. So I work with bariatric surgeons, I work with obesity doctors, psychologists, and pharmacotherapy as well, because there are some anti-obesity drugs on the market. And there's so much stigma with anti-obesity drugs, but the truth is they're no different than antidepressants. And there was a time in history that antidepressants had a stigma attached to them. People would say, why do you need antidepressant? You live in a nice house, you have a nice car, you have a good partner. You don't need antidepressants. Let's just pull up your socks. And we still have a long ways to go, but it's better. And it's the same sort of thing with anti-obesity drugs. It's sort of like, no, can't you just figure out how to eat keto? Like, no, you just got to join the gym. Like, what's wrong with you? Some people need it for a little step up, just like with an antidepressant, to be able to do the things they need to do to recover. And maybe it's for a short time only, but we need to be open to all of it. Oh, you are speaking our language. (laughs) Sandra, I am loving this. It's so true. You sound like you would be such a well-rounded coach to work with because it's so important to be able to sit at the table, listen to what others have to say. And, you know, we were talking to David West about this bias and, you know, whether it's this weight bias or this, you know, relentless pursuit of thinness. But I really did. I think Molly and I had a good conversation about that after and like, what are some of our biases that we need to get out there and open up with and that we don't have to be working with just that late stage food addict mm-hmm. and that we can be, we know prevention is way better than like you said, right? Actually like the post-treatment, if you can prevent them from getting to that place, that should be our goal. So I just loved everything you had to say. I actually recently was reading the magazine that you were in on weight bias put out by the College of Physicians and Surgeons in Ontario. So can you share a little bit about what your experience was in writing about what that was like for you Um, at the doctor's office? For sure. So what we do know is that over 70% of all patients report experiencing bias from their doctors in regards to their weight. And so I believe that obesity is a real medical condition. We know that obesity affects the brain. It affects the brain in a way that makes our reward center more susceptible to food cues, right? Whereas somebody who's been weight stable their whole life don't need to fight as hard against food cues and cravings like somebody who's lived with obesity. So my real passion in this area is really in terms of the way that my mother experienced bias and stigma at the doctor. So my mother was sick pretty much from the time that I was born. She was a food addict. She lived with morbid obesity and bipolar disorder. 
we now know obesity and bipolar disorder is often linked um, and it has something to do with inflammation. So we were searching, searching my whole life. And I was her translator because she didn't speak English from the age of eight or nine, having to translate such horrible things to her, you know, scare tactics. Like if you don't smarten up, eat better and lose weight by September, you know, and it's like June, you're going to be dead. And that was it. Like there was no, how do I do this? Here's some help. Here's some support. It's just like, what's wrong with you? Eat less. Otherwise you'll be dead and you'll leave your four children. And what do you think that did? Like that just pushed you further into blame and shame, further into her depression and further into eating for comfort. And she gained more weight. I can remember vividly, and I'm upset with myself because I was in my twenties and this would never be acceptable if this happened today. But she had to see a specialist for an eye condition. So because she was diabetic, the I guess the nerves or the veins in the back of her eyes were bleeding and they needed to be cauterized. And it was just one specialist in Toronto that would do this. And it was the kind of specialist you would get a nine o'clock appointment and you would see him at 3 p.m. And we would go into his office and he would yell at her because she was so heavy and he wasn't sure that his chair could support her. This was an OHIP government funded office. So if your office does not have a chair to accommodate you, that's called discrimination. Like I'm laughing about it now, but it actually makes my blood boil. But we didn't say anything like me and my mother filled with shame zipped it because he was the only doctor in Ontario that would work on her and her eyesight was at stake. And so, okay, yell at us, yell at us every time we come here that she is so big and she doesn't fit in your chair. Did you receive any feedback from that article? Anybody who read it? Like, did you think it really made a difference or? So I have a few doctors who reached out. So it basically goes to doctors, not patients. One of them said, I'm glad I saw your picture in that magazine and not mine. Because apparently if you're a fat doctor, you get your picture put in that magazine. But it's helpful because I think that for a lot of them, one doctor reached out and said, you know what? I always tell my patients that they have to eat less because I'm fat too. I'm like, that's not helpful. You got to stop saying that. (laughs) Like, Eat less. I hadn't thought of it. So I think it's sometimes with this one particular doctor, he just feels like because he is overweight, then he's able to say whatever he wants. But no, doctors take an oath to do no harm. That includes emotional harm. So you were talking earlier about building body acceptance for yourself and with others. So can you tell us how you work with individuals to get to that place of acceptance in, say, it's a bigger body? So lots of different things. But the first one is just an acceptance and a love when you mess up with your eating. So for a lot of us, including myself, when I messed up with my eating, I used to take out the shame stick. And I believed if I beat myself up long enough and hard enough, then I'll never do that again. And nothing was further from the truth because when I'm in emotional pain, even if I'm causing it, I want to eat. So the first step is always when you mess up for food, we're not going to call it a mess up. We're not going to call it a mistake. We're going to call it a call for love. You were calling for love. And the only person that can give you that love is you. So those are the moments you're going to be the kindest, the most nurturing, the most loving to yourself. So that already starts to have a little bit of shift in energy and appreciation. Then I ask people to do mirror work and I get a lot of pushback, but eventually they come around. I would have to say that's the most positive feedback that I get is there's a shift in the way they relate to themselves and see it themselves. So mirror work, just blessing and complimenting each and every part of their bodies. And also the other step I do is become a detective for everything that's good. I want you to find everything that's good, how you're improving, what's beautiful, what's right. Look for those things because what you look for, you shall find, right? What you seek, you find. And then how does that translate to the scale? Because I know we talked about that a little bit earlier, but how does that then like, okay, so you're like, okay, we're going to start with body acceptance, self-compassion. I love what you said, like calling it like it's a call for love. It's this asking for love and like maybe a very unlovable way, but here we are. So how then does that translate to like getting folks to break up with the scale and really just get into that recovery mind space? So I highly recommend and highly encourage my clients to not weigh themselves. And so I get a lot of pushback. And then I say, okay, 
So I need to understand, are you neutral about that number? Because this is what's going to happen to everyone. You're going to be doing really, really well. You might have two weeks where you eat on point, you're moving your body, and the scale will not budge. And it might even go up a pound. Are you neutral? No, I'm not neutral. (laughs) I'm angry. And I'm like, how many times has that happened? And then you gave in because what was the point? like many, many times. I can remember one person in clinic and I just broke my heart. She was doing so well for a month. And then she got on the scale and she had lost five pounds. Like it was still significant. And she thought, what's the point? And she threw it in and she was binging uncontrollably since getting on the scale. So my thing is, if you had never gotten on the scale, then you would have focused on everything else that was going well. You would have focused on how great it feels to be sugar-free, how better you're sleeping, how your mood's improving, how you're more present, how you walk freer, where you see life better. And that's where I want to get my clients. I want to get them to a place where I'm eating like this because it feels so good. And whether I lose a pound or not doesn't even matter because I can't go back to the way I was eating. The way I was eating was literally killing me. So I'm going to eat this way. I'm not going to focus on my weight and I'm going to enjoy the progress. The scale is a very inaccurate measure of success. It's probably the worst. And at the end of the day, if you're living your best life, like, why do you need to know? That's the other question. I go, why do you need to know what you weigh? And if we really unpack it, it's because they want to know how much can I eat and still lose weight, right? Or how little do I need to lose to keep losing weight? So when you tie what you eat to your scale, red flags, red flags, red flags. Because that's when you get into dangerous territories of restricting to make it go faster. And then you kick in the starvation mode, which means that you're going to gain it all back and then some more. It's My measure is always, are you neutral? If you're neutral, then go ahead. But I have yet to meet a food addict who's neutral about the scale. Well, with our clients and other professionals in this space as well, right? I mean, there's a lot of controversy, I think, or I don't know if controversy is the right word, but there's certainly conversation that needs to happen around weight bias amongst professionals and not just other food addiction clinicians, but also like nutritionists and dietitians and medical professionals for sure. But I just think like, okay, the three of us, right? We've got some skills at this point. We've got good foundations. Like we're probably pretty stable. We could probably make that assumption. And to know that we probably still have struggles. Like, do we weigh ourselves? Do we not weigh ourselves? If we get on that, will we be neutral about it? And then to think about our clients walking into a doctor's office or meeting with a clinician or a coach that does have weight bias and saying like, Hey, you're eating all the right things, but you must be overeating. You must still be doing something quote unquote wrong, because you're not in a smaller body. Yeah. Talk to us about that. What has been your experience? Yeah. With that? So I also do uh, training sessions for doctors <laughs> about this stuff. And it is a hard sell, but what gets them and they know I'm right is when you take a patient and the first thing you do is you put them on the scale and you record their weight. And then you bring them into the little room and say, oh, the weight is not important, but let's now talk. I'm like, forget it. You've already lost that patient. When it's the first thing that you do at the appointment, you are signaling this is the most important thing. Second of all, that patient is likely traumatized, right? Unless it's gone the right way. So sometimes they'll be very happy. And sometimes we know it'll plateau and sometimes it'll go the wrong way. And it's got nothing to do with how hard they try. Absolutely nothing to do with how hard they try. They may be traumatized. They're not going to be able to hear you. And that whole appointment is wasted. Or maybe they've gone on vacation and they know they're up a pound or two and now they stop coming because they can't face the first thing that you're going to do to me is put me on that scale. Even if you don't ask them, they feel like I got to tell you why I lost two pounds and they stop coming. And I could see, yeah, she's right. They do stop coming. So if you want to keep weighing them, know that you're going to lose 60% of them from coming back at the weight management clinics. And if you don't make the weight a focus, you got a chance to help them when they're really struggling. Because what happens when they really struggle, we all stay away from the scale. That was big. I had a big win at the Wharton Medical Clinic. At that time, they had five clinics in Southern Ontario. They saw over a thousand patients a month and they put up signs that said, skip the way in if you like, it's up to you. Yeah. So I was really proud of that. That's exciting. And I think what I'm reading between the lines here is we have to, as professionals, we have to step up and be advocates for not only for our clients we're actively working with, but also just potential, right? Potential people who would be stigmatized by 
weight bias, by discrimination of some kind because of chair sizes or somebody's preconceived notions on like what body shape I should be walking around in. So thank you for just really talking about those experiences. Yeah, go ahead. That's the point I want to make because I know that there are some 12-step programs that say you have to get on the scale once a month because it keeps you honest. I also think that's a fallacy because you can eat properly all month. And you can do everything right. And that scale can go up. And then it's perceived as a failure. Like you were dishonest because look, whereas go through menopause and see what happens to your body, go on a new medicine and you may gain some weight. And it could be the day that you picked that you're up three pounds. So this idea of attaching your weight to honesty uh, really bothers me. Great. And I mean, come on now, everybody listening, we know the research is out there. It shouldn't even be a debate anymore. Like yeah. a calorie is not just a calorie. There's hormones, there's yeah. different ways that things are absolutely. I mean, it's not even something we have to go on and on about, but you're right. That that kind of thing makes people not go back then to that 12 step program, yeah, right? Now and I'm so dishonest. Then, yeah, I gained two yeah. pounds. I must be dishonest and I tried my very best. I mean, yeah. I was in one 12 step program. And I used the wrong measuring spoon for my olive oil and I had to restart my days. And that for me was just too punishing. Like that's just not the way I want to live, right? So defeated. And I think I got less olive oil, but it didn't matter because I was being dishonest. I was like, no, I couldn't find a spoon. (laughs) I I wasn't being dishonest. Trust me. I wanted all my olive oil. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So shifting gears a little bit. So when it comes to food addiction treatment, can you just kind of explain to our listeners how you work with clients? We know like before COVID, there were maybe some intensive weekends where participants would like detox and recover together. Are you still hosting those? Do you do one-on-ones primarily, groups primarily? Like what would that look like if our folks want to look you up and they want to work with you? Like give us the gamut. For sure. For sure. So you can look me up on my website. So sandraalia.com, Sandra E L. IA.com. And I do many different modalities. So I have done intensive weekends. They are so fun. I still get emails, but of course in Ontario, we are not fully open. And until there is zero risk of transmission in one of my retreats, I will not have a retreat. I can't uh, risk people's health. So those will be on hold. I don't see them happening in the fall with the Delta, but maybe in the spring. And so there's those. And then there are what I used to do in clinic then became virtual. So they're eight weeks. And anybody who takes my eight-week program will say, oh, yeah, you're definitely a 12-stepper. There's definitely little bits and pieces about that. But the program is about shining a light over your entire life. So looking at family relationships and codependency, looking at forgiveness and anger. I do give out a meal plan, but you don't necessarily have to follow it. You could just simply eliminate refined sugar and refined flour. But it's, you know, in the last year and a half, it has been 100% virtual. And I can't say that it's my favorite. I really want to be in rooms with people. So in working with the different modalities that you've been doing, what have you found works best for the clients that are successful? Oh, there's no one size fits all. So for those of you who are food addiction counselors like myself, my best advice to you is you do not own your client's successes. I don't own them. They let they send me lovely emails and they say I changed their life, but I did. They own their successes. And on that same token, they own their failures. And there's no judgment in failure. Like failure is part of the human experience. Everybody fails. And that to me really helps my ego stay at the door. So that I am there to serve. I'm there to be a channel for my higher power as best as I can. And I treat all my clients the same. So it can't be me if that one person loses 95 pounds and one person's a chronic relapser, right? It's not me either time. So then do you see in particular clients that do do well, is there a few characteristics or just common traits that you see in them that you're like, wow, this person, you know, when you're just working with someone and you just kind of know? Yeah. It's generally people who've had a shift in perception when it comes to food. So what do I mean by that? They look at real food as food, and then they look at chemically engineered foods. So these are factory-made, nutrient-poor, 
disease-causing foods that come with a huge price tag for a food addict. That price tag is mental, emotional, physical, spiritual. It is so, and it just is not worth it anymore. It's no longer a treat. It's no longer an escape. It is really a drug. And they just want to focus on whole real foods. And so the better that you can cut out sugar and more completely, the better you have appetite correction, the cravings go down. But that's not to say that people can just do that. That could be a process. I'm thinking of one person who's had tremendous success after two years of doing my program. So that's the other thing that I'm very proud of is that people do my eight weeks and then sign up for another eight weeks. And I always say, It's the same materials and it's the same jokes, but they keep coming back for the community. The community is important. So my program sits on three pillars. The first pillar is eliminate your drug foods. The second pillar is community. You have to be tapped into a community of people trying to do exactly what you're trying to do. And the last pillar is mindfulness and spirituality. Addictive eating is mindless eating. So that mindfulness is one of the antidotes. And the spirituality is really about understanding your worth. So if you've struggled with your weight or your eating, that will chip away at your self-esteem and your self-worth. The spirituality just reminds you of who you are, reminds you of your worth, and that you do have inside of us all, we have the spark of the divine that is powerful, but we don't take the time to connect. So in working with clients then, I mean, and I love, I think your pillars are beautiful and I think Clarissa and I have similar, I mean, I don't think we've ever laid them out as pillars, so to speak like that, but I think we work from a very similar framework and I don't come from the 12 step world. I mean, I've participated in 12 step stuff. I've gone through the 12 steps. I mean, I've experienced it for myself that way, but primarily I come from a clinical base. I have my master's degree in mental health counseling. I am dual licensed in mental health and addiction. And a lot of what you have in your programs from what little I've seen of like the stuff that you have on your website, that kind of thing to understand more of what you do and what I've heard you speak about at times is that it is, it's all very, it's very rooted in good. I mean, there's just good foundational addiction medicine there if that makes sense, you know? And so I just really appreciate you explaining that for our clients. So when you work with clients, how do you evaluate that they're actually food addicts or does it matter? Do you use the Yale food addiction scale? Like talk to us about like how you might help somebody determine if they're questioning it. For sure. So when people used to go to the clinic, there would be a poster in every single patient room, the room. And the question was, are you addicted to food? And there would be the 20 questions that you would often find in a 12-step meeting. And basically I said, if you've answered yes to three or more, you may have food addiction. The only criteria for my program is if you feel that you are using food in a similar way as somebody who has alcoholism. Are you using food in a similar way as somebody who may be addicted to drugs? And is it overtaking your life? Are the consequences too much? So And the reason I do this and the reason why I was able to partner with doctors is because there's no downside to my program. I don't give a specific meal plan. I'm asking you not to have ultra processed foods. There's no risk there, right? If I was saying you have to have keto, they would be like, we can't, right? But if you're telling people don't have cupcakes and Doritos, we can get behind that. There's no downside to that, even if you're not a food addict. That's the best part, right? And even if you're not a food addict, if you bring in mindfulness and meditation, if you're tapped into a beautiful, loving community, like there's just no downside. You're so right. All of those things are going to change your life and make it so much more beautiful. And if you find out you're not a food addict, you're just going to be better off for it. Yeah. You might just want to stay this way anyways, right? (laughs) So what's something that you believed early on in your career when you first started this and that now you've discovered or you had to be a little bit more flexible with and maybe I think a lot of professionals don't like to say, oh, you know, I was doing something wrong 
right. getting that label. But I definitely know when you were speaking about that very strict food plan in the beginning, coming out of Infact, coming out of some other programs, that is what I was advising people with. And I've discovered it's just so much better when the client helps create their food plan, comes alongside you. So did you have any experiences? Yeah. So I think I was one of, in fact, no, I was, in fact, first class. <laughs> so I used to say I'm one of the first, world's first food addiction counselors. It was very hard for me to make my own way and leave the pack. So the way that I think, the way that I counsel, the way that I have many people at my table meant that I left the herd. Now, I feel like more people like yourselves are joining the herd. But when I left the herd, I also felt like I left my professional network because they were very... At that time, now in all fairness, I haven't been back to check. At that time, it was very rigid, very one way, and I didn't fit the mold. And even when I created Ontario's 28-day residential treatment program, I co-created that in Toronto. Again, I was that one out of the herd, and it was very difficult for me. But as a result, I went and found a new tribe that I am welcomed and loved. And this new tribe... It's a pretty impressive tribe. I'm not the smartest person in this tribe. Like they are top obesity doctors. They are the ones who are at the forefront of new guidelines, of changing the way we look at it, understanding how the brain's affected. And so I think that anybody should be weary if the treatment plan is something that we've always done for 60 years and we're not going to change it. Well, I mean, I don't want to go to a doctor who says, I'm still practicing the way Here's your meet your surgeon. He's still doing surgery the way they did it 50 years ago because he thinks that's the best way. Again, you have to kind of balance that with experience. I want a very experienced doctor, but I also want to take advantage of science and research and everything that we've learned. I think there's just embracing it and bringing it all together. So that was the hardest for me to leave the herd and it felt lonely for a little bit. Yeah. And as you were saying that, I'm like, and common sense and clinical experience, right? So I say that I'm trying to be funny, but also not in that, right? When you're actually working with clients and if you're a professional that has an open mind, you're willing to show up that you're open to being educated by your client. And it's not necessarily the other way around, right? Because if I'm going to be rigid and closed-minded, that means that my client walks into the room and it's my way or the highway versus when I walk in there with an open mind, I'm learning client's the teacher. And now, but then it's backed up with my professional training, that kind of thing, where I can do some reality checking. I've got lots of different tools that I can use there, but we're not necessarily still stuck in the dark ages with that one specific treatment plan over and over again, that isn't necessarily going to work for this person. So, um, Absolutely with the yeah. chronic relapsers, when yeah. somebody comes to you and says, I've been relapsing for 10 years, it's time to stop doing what you were doing. <laughs> yes. Like, stop. It's not you. It's the treatment plan. You're fine. You're perfect. You're worthy. You can do this. You just haven't found the right treatment plan. Now let's try. And even that you will see them just being released because imagine the shame and blame of trying to do something the exact same way for 10 years and not being able to do it. Right. And then have the same, maybe not the same person, but the same kind of right showing up saying like, well, you're just not doing it right. You're just not trying hard enough. Like you were saying earlier, right? Like somehow that that's a measure. Yeah. 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 Just go be in a little more pain and then come back when you do exactly what I say. And honestly, that did save me. So again, you know, my sponsor was tough on me and I could not trust my thinking when it came to food. And she was just like, you're going to do exactly what I said. And I needed that at the time. You know, I was 30 years old. I needed that, but I'm no longer part of a 12 step program, but I grew and I evolved. And now I can trust my thinking, not completely. I obviously need lots of help and intervention, just like any other addict, but that do exactly what I say doesn't work for everybody. I was lucky it worked for me. Okay. So do you have any idea how well your clients do long-term after working with you and your program? Like, what can you tell us about rates of relapse remission? Do you measure that? So like I said, I do have clients who take my program year after year after year. I have a handful that were there in the pilot in the clinic, but I don't keep that data. Now, The Wharton Medical Clinic did keep some of the data. I'm not sure if it was published, but it was great. The findings were fantastic. A couple of things to note. One was that the weight loss was greater 
So they had two groups. They had the clinic group that were not food addicts and traditional dieting. And, and then they had my group that did the food addiction and weight loss was greater, maybe by, I can't remember, 5%, but still 5% is better than no percent higher than the clinic's weight loss average. And the other thing that was very dramatic was quality of life. So that improved by 16 points. And they didn't see that with the people that didn't do my program. So that was interesting. But no, I don't do any research. I respect people's anonymity, but I think that's not good. Definitely. I think that it should be done. And perhaps with three sales, it's hard as a food addiction counselor to get research, right? But now that I've partnered with Dr. Sandy Van, we are looking into it, but it's not easy. It's definitely not easy to gather data, but it will be a little bit easier being connected to a doctor in a university. Yeah, that's so true. Like Molly and I are participating in a research treatment group right now on like a universal basis. And it's a lot of work, right? And we're we're just at the beginning where then we've got to follow these groups for two years. And then, you know, there'll be another cohort. We've got to follow them. And so it's a long process, but it is definitely something that will help like validate what we do and especially that well-being measures, right? That food can change your life. Yeah. Well, thank you both for doing that because that's not easy and that's what our field is lacking. So kudos to you guys to take on that big, enormous project. Well, you're taking on all the big, enormous project of all the doctors, right? And and getting us clinically accepted. And so can you speak to us a little bit about what the pushback was like originally when you first started, maybe even with like the Renaissance program and like what people were thinking, or is this completely out in left field? And then obviously you've spoken to us now about what it's like today. You're sitting at that table and people are listening, but what was it like then? And like, do you really really think there's like way more room for improvement. So when I joined Obesity Canada, I was the new kid on the block, normally only had doctors, psychologists, scientists, and then parent food addiction counselor. And I was so new and green. And I told my story to actually like the chairman. I'm like, listen, I'm a food addict. This is what I did. I lost a hundred pounds. He's like, okay, well, that's you're statistically insignificant. There's only 2% of the population can do what you did. So We can't really talk about what you did because most people can't do it and it's biased. I'm like, okay, I'll go sit down then. (laughs) And I learned over time, it's so interesting because five years later, they do an Obesity Canada Summit. And the last one that was in person in Ottawa, I did one keynote and two other talking presentations. I thought, okay, now I have arrived. I went from, can you please be quiet and sit down to can we ask you to speak at one of the keynotes? (laughs) So it takes time. It absolutely does. And it took a lot of me zipping it and listening and understanding where the synergies are, understanding where I can add value. So I just learned to be quiet. And I was quiet for two years. And then I came and spoke again. And and the chairman said to me, wow, I really have watched you evolve. Like I've really seen, I'm like, no, I was always like this but you didn't give me a chance, but he thinks I've really evolved. So I think that's one big key is really, and the thing with treatment centers, like I obviously I'm not going to comment on Renaissance, but there are treatment centers out there that still have a very punishing environment. So for a food addict, if they eat off their plan, they will be discharged from the program. And my opinion of that, and same with alcoholics and people with drugs, if they have a slip during treatment, they are discharged. So basically, you're punishing people for the disease that they came to be treated for. So it would be like, if you believe it's a disease, right? And the treatment center would say, oh, 100%, it's a disease for sure. But if you relapse in it, you've got to go and we're not treating you and we're locking the doors behind you. It would be like me going and saying, my cancer's back. Oh, it's back? Mm, sorry. But that's a disease too. So that's where I have some hard times with treatment centers. And I think they're changing. The tides are changing. But anybody who's interested in a research center, really do your homework on their philosophies. What does it mean if I eat an apple at 10 p.m. at night? You could be kicked out. And I don't think that's kind. I don't think that's treatment. 
No, that's, I mean, I think that's a great point. And it's so funny. I started out working in corrections Uh and I remember in the early days, it's a pre-release facility. So they're coming out of prison and other department of correction programs. And they all, to come to this specific residential facility, they all had to have substance abuse in their background. And early on, if they use, right, so they're going out into the community, they come back, we do counts every hour, like, but there are no locks on the doors, there's no bars on the windows, they're going out into the community, they're working, they're seeing their children, they're paying child support, all the things. So as you can imagine, they're also buying booze, and they're also hooking up with the heroin dealer. And in the early days, they went right back to jail, and they got, you know, and there would be like a jail stay, and then they could come back to the program, and or if it was bad enough, they went and did like more treatment or something along those lines. Now today, that just isn't true, right? Like they're recognizing like, oh, this is a disease and this is part of the disease, right? So they're not having to go back to jail or prison for a return to use. Yeah, absolutely. We're not going to punish people for having a disease. Right. Only took 2021. Yeah. Right. I know. It's right. Some part of me wonders like, was it 2020 COVID that prevent, right? Like that just kind of like made it harder to send people like more punishment. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So no, I think that's so great. And such a great point that am I going to be punished for something that I am actually going and asking for help about or for? Yeah, that's huge. So we heard a little bit about where our listeners can find you on your website. Can you tell us what you're working on now and how else they might be able to track you down? For sure. So I'm super excited. I'm launching a new program in September. It's called Get Abstinent, Stay Abstinent. So it is a 28-day program. So basically what it is, is treatment from the comfort of your home. Thank you, COVID. So it will include a meeting every single day with me from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. Sorry, 9 a.m. to I thought I said p.m. in there. So 9 to 10 in the morning. We are also, it's going to be small groups. So 10 people. You're going to go through the 28 days together. You're going to be paired up with an accountability buddy. You'll have a morning meeting with me. Then you'll have your buddy meeting in the evening. We will have guest speakers. We will have a weekend. I'm going to, I have somebody who's gone through the impact and she's going to run my weekend sessions for me so that my daughter doesn't get too mad at me. And it is really about taking the hand of a person and walking with them for 28 days, just as you would in treatment and get abstinent and stay abstinent. And you can get more information at my website, sandraalia.com. And the other way to get in touch with me where I do some great videos, Mindset Mondays and Tea Times is at 3 Sales on Facebook. So you can get a bunch of free content there. So it's just three, the number three, and then sales. And that's where Dr. Sandy and I push out a lot of content, a lot of videos. Well, that 28 program, a uh, day program sounds great. Like it sounds very much like a very supportive program. And we know with food, you need so much more of an intensive approach to this kind of recovery. And the reason it's two meetings a day is like in the morning, set the tone, learn how to meditate, learn how to have habits and practices. And then the next meeting will be your accountability meeting after dinner, which is the high risk. Everybody has a high risk time. So it's another chance to connect, to commit, to be together. One of the antidotes for addiction is often community, right? Addiction and loneliness is so interconnected. So my hope, because I'm curating the 10 people that do this program, my hope is that they become lifelong friends, right? You just Mm -hmm. never know. Yeah, they get a community out of it too. How great is that? So we do have a signature question that we'd like to ask you today. And it is, what is something you would tell a younger version of yourself about food addiction or food addiction recovery? What I would tell my younger self, I would start with, there is absolutely nothing wrong with you. You are perfect as you are. The more that you can see your greatness the more that you are comfortable with all of you, the shortcomings, the good stuff, the better your life is going to be. Don't fear food. Don't fight food. Don't use food. It's just let it be what it was meant for. Nourishment. Just know that you are worthy, you are strong, and you are capable. Because if I had known that, I may not have become a food addict. 
Yeah, that's so beautiful. I love that, Sandra. (laughs) I'm going to have to... Well, fortunately, I have it recorded so I can replay it after. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for joining us today on the Food Junkies podcast. And this has been wonderful connecting with you. And I think both Molly and I would love to be part of your herd. Yeah, for sure. I'd love that. We just invited ourselves, so... (laughs) what we do. Thanks for agreeing. That's another way is partnership. Every time I've partnered, I've grown exponentially. Don't do this alone. Partner with good people. Love it. Hey, thank you. Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group. I'm Sweet Enough. You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, the power is ours.